Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the ACLU of DC's annual membership meeting. As we start this evening, um, just uh, one housekeeping issue. We have a packed agenda this evening, um, so we will not be responding to any of the notes in the chat. Um, however, if you would like to be more involved or uh, contact us, you can do so at volunteer at ACLUDC.org or info at ACLUDC.org, and we'll drop those email addresses in the chat. And this evening, we want to start with a land acknowledgement. We take this moment to acknowledge the stolen and abused land that we occupy in the Washington, D.C. area. We acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Nakachank, Anacostan, and Piscataway people. They were among the first in the Western Hemisphere to encounter European colonists. Beginning in the early 1600s, white European settlers killed or displaced them. At the same time, thousands of African and African-American enslaved persons were held, bought, and sold on the land we occupy today. The District of Columbia was an active and profitable slave depot with slave auctions dotting the National Mall and groups of chained enslaved persons passing in the view of Congress and the White House every day. We honor the indigenous black lives that were taken by violent colonization and state sanctioned brutality, as well as the enduring strength of these indigenous and black communities. And we commit ourselves to turning this knowledge into action by fighting white supremacy in all its forms. I'm Monica Hopkins. I am the executive director of the ACLU of the District of Columbia. Tonight, we also welcome our new board members who just started their term. Our incumbent board members uh, returning Laura Arandes, Debbie Carliner, John Davis Malloy, Claudia Gordon, and James Weingarten. Next slide. And we welcome brand new board members who are joining us, Mark Eisenberg, Pranav Nanda, and Salima Snow. So this evening, we are giving you program updates. Uh, you'll be hearing from some of our staff. But before we begin, I would like to just sort of welcome you and give you a little bit of a, a top line view of the last year here at the ACLU of DC. Last year, you may remember at the end of the summer, we felt that we may be coming out of the pandemic. And then we went back into the pandemic. And the pandemic is not over, but we've begun reverse engineering this to think through how do we bring people together safely? How do we make ourselves and our work accessible to everyone? During the last year, we also did a deep look inward. We being the staff and the board have engaged in an equity audit for our organization. And it was comprehensive in its nature to see, do our ideals and practices match the work that we do? Is our intent to do good felt in the impact we have on the communities we serve? And is who we think we are actually how people experience us? This was a comprehensive project and it was the starting point also to give us information as we embark on our strategic planning process 
we look forward to in the next year sharing with our members what our strategic priorities are, what our goals are, and what our values are. But this isn't just about the work we do externally, which you will hear a lot about this evening. It is about the work that we do internally as well. And we've been examining our own organizational practices and processes and making sure that we are a continuous learning organization. Because liberation, freedom, and justice are an inside out job that we must do with integrity. I also want to take a moment this evening as we're welcoming you to recognize the people within the ACLU of the District of Columbia. You will hear from a portion of our staff. Some of you may have met some of our staff out in the community. But there are a lot of other staff members doing things that are behind the scenes that help us operate on a day-to-day -day basis, such as helping us put on this webinar. Mm. We have an infrastructure that allows us to fulfill our mission and do really great work. And we want to thank those people for carrying us through a really great year. I don't want to take too much time from my colleagues to tell you about this great work. So I'll introduce you first to Scott Michaelman, who is our legal director, to tell you about some of our legal work. Scott? Thank you, Monica. And it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, last year, you heard me uh, tell you about a number of cases that we were beginning or continuing, and I'm pleased to be able to report tonight that we've not only expanded our team and our efforts, but brought a lot of our pending cases that I told you about last year to successful resolutions. So I'll start with a few things about our team and overall program, and then move on to some highlights from the past year. Uh, next slide, please. So our breakdown, as uh, similar to last year, uh, most of our work is in active cases, that is cases in litigation in the federal or District of Columbia courts, um, some of which have been authorized for litigation, some of which are in the midst of litigation, others that uh, we're on appeal, so they may be in any stage. Others are amicus briefs and non-litigation advocacy, uh, such as Know Your Rights presentations, supporting our colleagues in other departments, such as advising on uh, our policy colleagues on bills before the DC Council, uh, or filing Freedom of Information Act requests. And finally, 15 to 20 significant investigations uh, that may turn into cases in the future. And I'll, I'll give you a sense of where, a, a, a vague sense of where some of those are going, understanding that, that it's uh, too early before we file to, to give you the details. Um, the other the other big sort of big big picture thing about our our team is that we've been able to grow. We are now at five litigators and two support staff. Um, the support staff being our uh, our intake manager and our intake specialist, and the litigation uh, attorneys supplemented now. Uh, we're now we're up to five supplemented uh, by external funding as well as the the salaries that. Uh, that our members, our donors, our supporters uh, generously help to fund. And we could not do this work. We could not do as much work as we do without. So what have we done? Next slide, please. I'd, I'd like to highlight in uh, many of the same areas that I spoke about last year, successes and, and works in progress in four major areas, speech, policing, jail, and immigration. In the area of freedom of speech and particularly protesters' rights, we have been continually on the front line of uh, protest work, in particular with our case about the attack, the brutal attack on the demonstrators who were raising their voices for civil rights on January 1st, 2020 in Lafayette Square, just outside of the White House, where 
protesters were brutally tear gassed, shot with rubber bullets, and beaten uh, about a half an hour before then President Trump spoke at a church across the street. We've been continuing to fight for accountability. Our damages claims were dismissed, that is money compensation claims, but we are appealing that to the DC Circuit Federal Court of Appeals. But meanwhile, we're very pleased to announce that in a significant breakthrough, we achieved a settlement for part of our claims, the claim seeking a court order to prevent these types of abuses in the future. We negotiated over a period of months with the Biden administration and were able to announce this spring that we secured uh, over a dozen policy changes, including uh, new restrictions on the use of riot gear, the requirement of audible warnings before dispersals and a safe route to disperse, uh, the requirement that park police wear visible identification, a non-discrimination policy, and prohibiting the Secret Service from engaging in guilt by association policing, as well as a prohibition on the park police revoking a permit in the absence of a clear and present danger. So we're pleased to say that this case has uh, litigated with our partners, the Lawyers Committee and the law firm of Arnold and Porter. This case has already made significant change even as we continue to fight on seeking compensation for the people injured on that shocking day. We also achieved a major victory for freedom of speech in the Court of Appeals this, uh, this past year in a case about the rights of 1,100 employees of the federal courts. These are administrative staff of the federal courts who assist behind the scenes. And they were prohibited, they work for an office called the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, and they were prohibited by a new code from engaging in the most basic acts of political participation, such as expressing their views publicly on candidates for office, uh, displaying bumper stickers, opining on social media, attending events, listening to candidate speeches, giving money, joining a party, and more. We enjoined, we, we got those restrictions enjoined in 2020. The government appealed, and we got an affirmance from the DC Circuit that actually said not only were the, uh, the seven we had won on in the district court uh, unconstitutional, but in fact, another two that we had also challenged that we hadn't won on were also unconstitutional. So the government appealed and we, uh, the result of that after we cross appealed was that we increased our, our victory. Moving on to policing. We, next slide please. Um, we uh, concluded a number of significant cases this year. And the, the big highlight here was uh, the case of Muimanzi versus Wilson. This was a case we originally took because of MPD's troubling invasive search practice, particularly in uh, sexually sensitive areas. The, this is an issue on which we litigated before. And uh, a, a man had been searched in a friend's apartment in an invasive and humiliating way. We sued uh, for, for compensation for him and uh, to continue to put pressure on MPD to change its policies and change its training. In the course of our litigation, we discovered another problem we hadn't even known about, that he was being searched pursuant to a policy and a DC law that, uh, that permits officers executing a warrant on a place to search anybody they happen to find inside, whether or not they're connected to the warrant in any way. This is unconstitutional. And so we added to our case a challenge to this law and policy as well. This spring, a court agreed with us and uh, both preserved our claims about the sexually invasive nature of the search and held that the DC law was unconstitutional. So we are, uh, again, as, as I've said, on really the front lines, both in terms of policing and in terms of speech. Another, um, Another key policing case for us, we settled uh, a case in which uh, a man experienced a prolonged police stop so that, um, so that officers could call a dog to sniff around his car, even though he wasn't being 
uh, pulled over for anything that uh, that a dog could find. He wasn't being pulled over for drugs or anything of that nature. And we suspect that it was a racially motivated delay. And uh, we, we settled that case as well. We're still fighting in a case about prolonged seizures of protesters' cell phones. That was our case about that was dismissed about a month ago. And just today, we filed our notice of appeal to the DC Circuit. Moving on to jail. Next slide, please. We achieved significant settlements in two cases that I told you about last year. One, Banks versus Booth, which was our challenge, along with our partners, the Public Defender Service of the District of Columbia and Munger, Tolls and Olson, the law firm, uh, to the, uh, the DC Department of Corrections, really appalling lack of precautions and care taken to protect the residents of the jail facilities from the ravages of the pandemic. And a district court agreed with us and uh, issued an injunction that was in place for over a year, holding that the district had been unconstitutionally indifferent to the needs of the people that it incarcerated. We settled the lawsuit uh, this past winter for in exchange for a series of conditions improvements backed up by independent monitoring. And that monitoring just recently concluded with some documented improvements, although we, we know we, we are not under any illusions that the, the DC jail is still uh, a frighteningly inhumane place and we have a long way to go, both in further litigation, uh, potentially, and in conjunction with our partners in, in our policy department at getting in place a more uh, enduring oversight. One of the things that, uh, one of the limitations of litigation is that these settlement agreements can only last so long. And so we got what we could and obtained, I think, one of the most successful settlements in the country in terms of COVID conditions litigation. But, but we will continue to fight for those behind bars who are too often out of, out of sight and out of mind. Our other major win in the jail area was in the case of Sunday Hinton, a trans woman who was wrongly housed in the men's unit of the DC jail under a policy where the jail assigned people to housing based on their anatomy rather than their gender identity. The district settled with us uh, this spring and agreed to, during the course of the litigation, agreed to drop its anatomy criterion and then uh, settled the rest of the litigation with us for an agreement to stop shackling people in protective custody, who, which was also often where they put trans people that they had wrongly housed because they were uh, in danger as a result of the, um, of the district's discriminatory decisions. We continue to monitor the jail's compliance with these procedures and, uh, and hope not to hear results of further abuse, but again, uh, know that, that we need to keep a close eye on that institution and that agency. Finally, in the area of, uh, of immigration, where we most often partner with our national office, we've, um, we were able to blunt or roll back some of the most significant abuses of the Trump administration. In our case about the, the so-called migrant protection protocols, an Orwellian term for a policy uh, that most of us know by the name Remain in Mexico, under which uh, immigrants facing incredible danger are left on the Mexican side of the border in some of the most dangerous parts of the world. Um, we were able to get all of our clients, in, in that case, into the United States. And as a result of this case and others, filed across the country by the ACLU and others, um, the Biden administration finally repealed the policy this summer. We also obtained, after obtaining an, an injunction during the Trump administration against the expansion of a very dangerous process called expedited removal, which also puts migrants into danger by removing them from the country without sufficient procedural safeguards. We, after enjoining that, the Biden administration paused it and finally this year agreed to rescind the Trump administration's expansion of this dangerous program. And finally, in terms of border admissions, 
the so-called Title 42 program under which the Trump administration was using the COVID pandemic as an excuse to prevent uh, migrants from seeking humanitarian protection, such as asylum. We were able to get injunction, get it, two different injunctions against the use of that policy. The Biden administration has ended it with respect to minors, and we are still fighting for the Biden administration to end this protectual uh, exclusion of migrants uh, as against uh, as against all migrants as as the the Biden administration has has continued to use the pandemic as an excuse to bar people from the country, even the most vulnerable of migrants. And so it's been a year where I think we've made a lot of great progress and we look forward in the coming year to filing cases, we hope, in the areas of protesters' rights, discrimination, and policing. We hope to fire, file major cases in those areas. Um, and I hope to be able to tell you more and report on our progress when I see you at this time next year. Again, thank you very much and thank you for your support that enables us to continue fighting uh, as, as, we, as we do and as we must do. And now I'd like to turn it over to our policy director and to see Moshery, who could not be with us tonight, but joins us for a visit video presentation. Hi, everyone. My name is Nasi Moshri, and I'm Policy Director at the ACLU DC. I'm excited to share with you some highlights of our policy and advocacy work from this past year and offer a preview of some things we're working on this fall. In our policy department, we accomplish our work uh, in three ways. Through lobbying with the DC Council and the mayor to the policy, through organizing efforts to mobilize DC residents to take action, and build relationships with community members that are most impacted by the policies we seek to change, and through public education and outreach efforts, including our Know Your Rights training, our participation in community events, and our volunteer engagement program. In exciting news, and thanks to the support of members like you, we have a new organizing director joining us this fall, and we will be significantly expanding our work through a new organizing department. The overarching theme of our advocacy work over this past year has been achieving community safety. Next slide. So what does this mean? This means pushing the DC Council and the mayor to enact policies that uphold civil rights and civil liberties of all district residents, that end the systemic racial and economic injustices deepened by DC's over-reliance on policing and incarceration, that are measurable and evidence-based, and that invest significant resources in meeting the needs of communities. This past year, we have been focusing our efforts on some key issues, including criminal justice reform, systemic racial and economic justice, privacy rights, and voting rights. I'm gonna share with you just a few highlights from each of these issue areas. Criminal justice reform is one of the biggest areas of our work. Um, over the past two years, we have been tirelessly advocating for limitations on existing police powers and practices that regularly violate the rights of civilians interacting with law enforcement. We testified before the, count before the council at countless hearings, and we have organized with community partners on everything from limits to use of force, improving public access to body-worn camera footage, banning the use of chemical weapons at First Amendment rallies, and significantly increasing transparency over cases of police misconduct. This fall, we anticipate the passage of a comprehensive police reform legislation, which we hope will enact into law uh, many of our recommendations, as well as those made by the DC Police Reform Commission more than two years ago. The ACLU DC is also a founding member of the Police Free Schools Coalition. Last year, our coalition had a huge win when the council passed legislation to phase out the presence of police in schools over the next few years, relying on decades of data that police presence increases student referrals to police, increases school-based arrests, and shifts the school environment from one that is focused on learning to one that is focused on 
over-discipline and criminalization. However, this past spring, the mayor attempted to reverse this phase out by including language in her budget proposal that would have repealed the law. Thanks to the efforts of our coalition partners and to uh, members like you taking action, the council held strong to its commitment to achieve police free schools. This win is an important step to creating safer school environments for all DC students. Um, and moving forward with this coalition, our focus is to continue to combat the narrative that police make schools safer and to push for non-police resources to our schools that will actually make them healthier, safer, and more equitable. Another major focus for us this past year has been looking at the conditions of the DC jail that perpetuate harm rather than rehabilitation. Um, as you've heard about our litigation, as part of our integrated advocacy model, just as we've been litigating unlawful jail conditions over the past several years, on the policy side, we've been actively calling for strong independent accountability and oversight of the DC Department of Corrections, which runs the jail facilities. This fall, we are gonna be pushing for two significant pieces of legislation alongside our coalition partners. One that will end the inhumane practice of solitary confinement at the jail, and another that will empower a new independent oversight body to regularly and publicly report on conditions and treatment of those held in the jail facilities. And the last highlight of our uh, criminal justice reform work is uh, uh, something that has really been led by our organizing department, um, and that is Court Watch DC. The ACLU DC is a supporter and co-convener of Court Watch DC, which is a local court watch program that was founded by formerly incarcerated Black women and is led by our organizational partner, Harriet's Wildest Dreams, and which launched this past July. Court Watch DC provides training and space for community members to observe local proceedings in DC and document injustices in our court system, to observe the impact of our local policies as they play out through the courts, and to hold judicial actors accountable. As a supporter, this past year, we have helped develop trainings um, for Court Watch DC. We have staff members that are fully trained to conduct Court Watch. And looking ahead, we are now recruiting ACLU DC volunteers to train and conduct Court Watch on Saturdays and Mondays. So if you are um, interested in this, please go to www.courtwatchdc.org for more information. Um, I'm gonna shift a little bit now and uh, tell you a highlight of our work to address systemic racial and economic injustice. This past July, we fought hard alongside organizations like Zedek DC and DC Fiscal Policy Institute to successfully urge the council to pass the Clean Hands Certification Equity Amendment Act of 2021. This legislation amends the district's Clean Hands Law, which prohibits DC residents from getting or renewing driver's licenses or permits if they owe more than $100 in fines and fees to the district. Under the current law, wealthier residents can simply pay off their fines, while lower income residents who can't afford to pay them face serious consequences including late fees that compound their debt, limited employment opportunity, uh, opportunities, and significant restrictions on their ability to travel. The structure of DC's fines and fees law also exacerbates, exacerbates the already wide wealth gap between black and white district residents. And it disproportionately places black drivers at direct risk of violent confrontations with the police who can use debt to justify pretextual stops. Once the new law goes into effect next October, DC residents will no longer be barred from renewing their licenses because of unrelated debts. Um, and this is really just one step towards fixing the district's fines and fees structure. We hope to expand that work more into the coming year. Uh, moving on to our work on privacy rights, 
This past year, we continue to expand our community oversight of surveillance campaign, uh, which is focused on ending unchecked government surveillance, including by holding uh, something that we, we accomplished this year is we held several listening sessions with community members directly impacted by police surveillance. The message of this campaign is a simple one. It's that DC does, residents deserve to have a say in what surveillance technologies police and other government agencies are using, how that information is being used and stored, and who it is being shared with. The recent criminalization of abortion that is sweeping the country highlights the risks of government surveillance to our basic rights. For example, while DC remains a safe haven for abortion, there is nothing currently stopping DC police from sharing surveillance data that would help other states enforce abortion bans and restrictions. For example, by sharing surveillance data about a pregnant person's travel to DC to seek care. Protecting our privacy means taking control over how our government uses surveillance tools. And we would love for you to get involved in this campaign. To learn more about it, please visit our website at takecontroldc.org. You can see it um, there on the screen. Speaking of reproductive justice and abortion rights, post Dobbs, the ACLU DC is committed to doing everything we can to ensure that DC remains a safe haven for abortion. In the council this summer, we testified in strong support of two bills that uh, reaffirm existing protections for people seeking abortions and other gender affirming health care in the district, and that also expand protections for those who assist and support others with self managed abortions. For now, the message that we really want to make sure everyone has is that abortion remains legal in the district. People younger than 18 can get a legal and safe abortion in DC through their entire pregnancy for any reason without parental notification. The district has a long history of making safe and legal abortions accessible to both DC residents and people coming from other states to get this critical health care. And you can be sure that we will be doing everything we can to make sure that continues. Um, however, we do know that DC's lack of statehood makes our status as a safe haven vulnerable. And that gets me to our final priority campaign that I wanna share with you tonight, which is DC statehood. Lack of DC statehood affects all of our issue areas. You can see on the screen, um, the various issue areas that are impacted by our lack of statehood. I'm not gonna go through all of the examples on this slide, but to highlight a few that we have talked about tonight, um, because DC is not a state, Congress can attach a writer to the DC budget every year that says that DC cannot spend our own local tax dollars to help pay for abortions. This restriction means that BIPOC and low income communities have to jump through significant hurdles to access abortion care. It also impacts our criminal justice reform because DC, because in DC, all felonies and some misdemeanors are prosecuted by the federal US attorney who has no accountability to local voters. And in the district, we also do not have control over our own prison and parole systems. And finally, Congress has in the past and can continue to block DC from passing and implementing legislation that has the full support of DC residents. In doing so, it has cost the district hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue that could be invested in local communities. So I know that all sounded like a lot of terrible things, um, but there is hope in our DC statehood effort. Last year with the passage of the Washington DC Admission Act in the House, we came closer than we have in 200 years to achieving statehood. And the Senate's version of the bill has 46 sponsors and hopefully will only continue to grow. More Americans today support DC statehood than ever before, and we're going to make sure that number continues to rise. To learn how you can help us and get help us by getting in this fight, uh, please visit our new DC statehood website at dcstatehood.now. Sorry, dcstatehoodnow.org. 
you can see it here um, on the screen. Uh, and uh, finally, you know, I just want to thank all of you for your support and work and uh, for opening those action alert emails, for reaching out to your council members, and for volunteering with us um, at events. We have some really exciting opportunities coming up uh, this fall for you to engage in all of the efforts I spoke about tonight and some efforts that I didn't even have an opportunity to mention. So please uh visit our site engage with us on social media sign up uh to be a volunteer and um we can't wait to um accomplish all of our goals this year thanks Hello, everyone. Um, so happy that Ms. Zing was able to share that lovely update. Um, but hi, I'm, I'm Amber Taylor. I am the Strategic Communications Director for the ACLU of the District of Columbia. Um, and I have the esteemed pleasure of working with my colleagues, uh, Tama Thomas, who is our Digital Communications Strategist, and Yvonne uh, Sosarski, who is our, our brand new Senior Communications Strategist. Um, and we worked tirelessly to both educate and advance the uh, legal policy and organizing efforts in the media and in, in our community about what we're doing here in the district. Uh, next slide. So a couple of highlights for this from this year. Overall, we've been doing a lot, um, a lot of work in the press to get our um, issues and our um, victories and um, and um, work out um, in the press. We've um, this year alone, we've been able to get about um, over two million people to across the nation to see our issues, and this is like uh, both an impressive uh, rate because we've been able to get press both in the Washington Post, CNN, uh, W, um, uh, USA Nine. DC is just name a few. Some of the highlights from this year were around our Black Lives Matter, the Trump uh, partial settlement lawsuit. We were able to get that story featured in New York Times, CNN, MSNBC, um, just name a few. The story got picked up nationwide and we're really proud of both the, our legal work but also our communications work to to make sure people understood that when their rights are violated, we are going to continue to fight for them and with them um, in the courts and in the streets for years to come. Just to put the, our work into perspective, um, if we were to try to get the same amount of media coverage through paid advertisements, we would have to pay a little over $800,000. And trust me, we don't, spend, we don't spend that much money on advertising. So we're very happy about the amount of work that we've been able to put out to get um, people across the district and across the nation um, tuned in to what we're doing here in the district. Next slide. But our work is both um, getting our, our stories and issues out in the press, but also getting our own communication um, through our own uh, unique platforms. For instance, through our blog. We have a blog that we produce almost on a monthly basis uh, where we showcase stories and issues that are impacting people right here in the district. One of the things that we're doing currently is developing local storytellers to do exactly exactly that, tell their story, tell how civil liberties and civil rights have been violated so that they can take more ownership of their own story and get it out uh, to the public. And we're using our blog as a way to highlight their stories, but also give people a platform to showcase both how they have been violated, but also how they are advocating for themselves to make sure that their civil rights and civil liberties are protected and advanced. Um, we have about over 3,000 people regularly looking at our, our blog posts. Um, some stories to highlight were how the um, district has been underfunded by hundreds of thousands of dollars due to lack of statehood. 
we highlighted um, a story about Courtney Phillips, who is a trans woman who was housed at the DC jail, um, inconsistent, with, inconsistent with her gender identity at, in the men's unit at the DC jail and how that affected her, how that uh, put her personal health, her personal safety at risk, um, and how when she was housed in the women's unit, how she just felt much better, was able to um, not feel as scared uh, for just her basic safety while she was incarcerated, um, along with our work on criminal, criminal legal reform work. So really proud to, as we are developing and highlighting these stories across the district, and more stories are to come related to how abortion um, has, you know, is going to be impacted uh, now that we are in this post-row world. We put out a um, toolkit um, uh, called Abortion Access in DC, which has information about how um, how abortion rights have been impacted in the district, what people can do now to continue to advocate and fight for more abortion rights, along with videos and resources on what they can do. We also put out information via social media. Our Instagram and Twitter has grown steadily, and we now have over 24,000 followers across the social media platforms. Our social media platforms allow us to engage with folks in real time about what's going on here in the district. So when there's a protest at the Supreme Court, or when people, um, when there's a, a breaking news story and people are asking questions about what they should do, how they should go about exercising their rights, we can put out in real time both know your rights information, how to get in contact with our um, our uh, our legal intake um, services, which allow us to uh, showcase how um, allow us to engage with folks around legal requests. And, uh, and connect folks with other organizations that are doing work here on the ground um, that we can uplift um, via our social media channels. And you know, last but not least, we also have our newsletter, which I hope everybody has gotten in the mail this far. Um, our summer newsletter showcase our uh, Black Lives Matter work, our Court Watch DC work, our surveillance work, along with highlighting all the new employees um, that have joined the ACLU um, in the past year. And we're so happy that we're continuing to grow and strengthen our work. We also regularly send emails out to um, almost uh, 35,000 uh, residents across the district. And if you're not on our email list, I would suggest that you do, because it's awesome. Our emails allow us to uh, engage about what's happening for our legal work, but also when we have breaking things happening in the council, when we need people to uh, sign up and testify and contact their council members. That's a primary way that we uh, communicate with our members about what's going on and how they can get engaged um, and stay connected with our work. I would, you know, if we are currently also working on our next newsletter, so keep your eyes out in your mailboxes for that newsletter. Hopefully it will come out um, in December. And yes, yeah, so our next email should be coming out in October related to work happening in the DC Council. Um, again, I really appreciate you taking the time this evening to talk, uh, to listen to us talking about our work. And I will do nothing else but kick it over to Monica uh, to close us out. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Um, just one note, uh, when speaking about the people behind the scenes, uh, we felt like it was really important that you hear from our communications department too. Oftentimes it does go on behind the scenes, but it is part and parcel and a really important piece of our work because we could do all of the great work that we do. And if nobody knew about it, uh, we wouldn't be able to empower people to take ownership of their own rights and know how to do that. I also want to note that this will be the last membership meeting um, for Nassim Moshri, our policy director, uh, who is moving out of state and I want to thank her for building such an amazing 
policy department and advocacy department, so much so uh, that we had to break it off and actually uh, have an independent organizing department, recognizing that as a key skill and department to doing our work. I also, behind the scenes, want to thank our board of directors um, who guide this organization uh, by engaging in the visionary work, making sure that we are good stewards of donors' money, that uh, we are following all the laws <laughs> that we need to, and serving um, as a sounding board for uh, your ED. I also want to thank all of you, our members, our donors, our supporters, our volunteers. Sometimes all of you operate behind the scenes and every time you engage with us, it really makes us know that people are supporting us when the work can be very difficult at times. This has been an incredible last five or six years, working diligently and on all cylinders through the Trump administration, just when we thought we might see a little bit of a light, we saw the January 6th insurrections, followed by a pandemic, followed by a racial reckoning, followed now by over 9,000 migrants being bused into the District of Columbia. And for all of that, the ACLU of the District of Columbia is here to ensure that our civil rights and civil liberties are protected, and we could not do this work without you. So thank you very, very much to everyone who works behind the scenes to ensure that we can do the work that we need to do. Please make sure that you follow us on social media, that you have signed up for our email list, that you are getting engaged to volunteer on our campaigns, to volunteer for Court Watch DC. And additionally, thank you and continue to be a member and to donate to this vital work. Finally, what is this work? I think about that a lot. And I wanted to close with some words from Amanda Gorman because I think that this sums it all up. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. Thank you for allowing us to do this work. Thank you for being part of this work. We look forward to working with you in solidarity. Have a great evening.